Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning study and a new week of morning studies. And I know many of us have had a difficult week, and um, but also the past Sabbath, even though it might have been difficult, it still always is a blessing. And um, we look forward to this week. We know that we need God's strength and help in studying and in our personal lives. And so I ask you to join me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are our God, that you love us and care for us, and that you have spoken to us in these last days and revealed to us your will for us individually, and that you have us participate with you in this work upon the earth revealing Christ's character to those that are in darkness. And we just ask, Lord, that the light from your word will shine upon us and that we'll see more clearly uh, your character and your purposes and that we can um, share these things with others. Help us each day, and especially today, to show forth your praises. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. I've been looking over the things that we have studied on Daniel chapter 11, verse 37 to 39. And I'm just going to kind of briefly go through it and address some of the points that we're still maybe uncertain about or that we need to examine further. Now, of course, we know that this this is part of a section that is describing the man of sin. The son of perdition that we see mentioned in Second Thessalonians chapter two, and Ellen White uh, quotes this and talks about uh, the history and connection with this prophecy being repeated. And so we know that we can take this history, not just in this part, but all through Daniel eleven, and we can make a present truth application. We can see its repetition. Now, some of the times when we're looking at the present truth application. It's it's very particular to this movement. It doesn't seem to be the case here. This seems to be a little broader, a little bit more zoomed out, and that sort of makes sense. It also doesn't appear to be a line, per se, in, in the way that other things are lines. It's just describing the man of sin and the work that he does, though it does deal with things that we see in really in Revelation 14 so and 13. Um, and we've seen that when we've been going through parts of Daniel 11, how it relates specifically to Revelation, or Revelation relates specifically to these passages in Daniel chapter 11. So it says, neither shall he papal Rome, and we have that as papal Rome in a historical context, and that's going back to, so when, when we go back here, I just want to go back, I guess, a little bit. Because in verse 36, so this is this is the the verses. It's um, she actually quotes. Is it one to 36 that she quotes? I'm trying to remember. I believe so. Okay, one to 36. So 37 to 39 just is extending from verse 36. It's describing that, but she doesn't quote 37 to 39. So when we get to uh, verse 36, and the king, papal Rome, the king of the north. The papacy through the image of the beast by the USA shall do according to his will. And this is a mark as with Babylon, we have Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. It refers to the Sunday law crisis. And, and we have a secondary zoom in, that is, we zoom in the Sunday law crisis is typified in the pandemic. And um, he shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, he shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Describing the man of sin in Second Thessalonians, as we talked about in Great Controversy, Chapter Three. Again, this is dealing with the Sunday Law, which in, in the present truth application, but also zoomed into the pandemic, and shall prosper till the indignation, the 1260 years of papal persecution, be accomplished, and that would be in 1798. For that, that is determined, and here we have. Uh, this 45 years between 1290 and 1335 uh, shall be done. So we're saying that this this is talking about the 45 years in Millerite history, and we're saying that this is representing the 45th president, Trump. So we can see that there is this, this connection to more a zoomed-in part, at least 
in part in this, even though it's still kind of zoomed out. So when we get to the next verse, verse 37, neither shall he papal Rome, again, this is just talking about papal Rome historically. And then we're saying the papal Rome is representing Satan through the auspices of the papacy, the USA and the UN. So he papal Rome shall, he shall regard, neither shall he regard the gods of his fathers. Now, you know, somebody commented on the video from Thursday and said that this is nonsense and that the God of his fathers is the true God. You know, so we've looked at that. And if we took that position that papal Rome is not regarding the God of his fathers, then we would have to say that those are, oh, where's the 45 coming from in the previous verse? So the lexical sum of Daniel 1136 is 82,499 days. That's going to bring us to our history. I think we just dealt with it as that that was determined, the part that is cut off out between the 1290 and the 1335. Does anybody remember specifically? I mean, because we put that this is the 45 years between the 1290 and the 1335. And that is that that is determined. So we're using that as cut out. And Miller understood that to some degree with the 45 years. So it's just the difference between that. So we have the last end of the indignation or the indignation ending in 1798. For that that is determined shall be done would refer to that period of time to the end of the 1335. And I think it's part of this has to do with the connections that we made with Daniel 12. So, yeah, so we say see Daniel 12, verse 11 to 12, right? And Daniel 12, verse 11 to 12. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So we're just saying that that must be the period that's being talked about, that 45 years. Does that help answering your question? Yes. Because I know we, we had gone through it in more detail before, but that, that's how we came to determine that determined uh, that that is determined is that 45 year period historically. Right. So we just relate that in the present truth to the 45th president and neither shall he, uh, people Rome regard the God of his father. So we were looking at this and, and the question is if the God of his fathers is the true God, that means his fathers are the Christian church. Now we, we could argue that we could say, well, yeah, that refers to the Christian church, but it seems more likely that the father really of papal Rome is pagan Rome. And, and we know that papal Rome does not regard the gods of pagan Rome in word, but I mean, it, it is paganism clothed in Christian garb. So to me, that makes the most sense, whether we're going to say that that has to be that way. I'm not, I'm not arguing that this is that I'm hundred percent right on this. Uh, but to me, that just seems to make the most sense. And then because there's going to be three different things that are listed, right? He's not going to regard the gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. And this seems to fit well with, uh, you know, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Right, this sort of what you you see and and hear the rejection of the promise, see the rejection of the everlasting gospel and the three angels' messages. That's that's representing what happens with Protestantism. It doesn't. It it has to deal with that desire of women, right? So, so this just would show that Satan, working through these three powers, he's still not really acknowledging these powers, right? He's, you know, he's. I don't know. I don't know how to word it or really how to frame it. But Satan is working through the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. But the whole purpose is that he is magnifying himself above all. That is, he wants to personate Christ. He wants to be God upon earth. And he's doing it through these different means. So when he magnifies himself above all, when it says that, we know, of course, that refers to papal Rome. 
it's the man of sin, the son of perdition, right? This is the papacy. But yet the papacy itself is typifying Satan. Now, you know, there's this, I guess I'll call it a conflict. This, this conflict of ideas within Adventism that I've noticed ever since I've been an Adventist. There are some Adventists who really focus a lot on what the papacy is doing. And you can see this with people like Daniel Fontenot. His main concern is always the papacy. Uh, and then there are other Adventists. They tend to focus a lot more on the United States and Protestantism, right? Because they know the Sunday law comes from the United States. And so these different emphases that I've, that I've noticed with, with different people, they don't seem to mix too well. It is, and, and, and we could look at it sometimes even with the different, uh, you know, we also have people who really focus upon things like the WEF or the UN, right? But we know that Babylon is, has got these different characteristics, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, that are all searching for the same goal. They all profess to have the same goal. We can say, well, obviously the Catholic Church, the universal church, uh, wants to be the universal church. They believe that everybody's going to have to become Catholic at some point. With Protestants, they believe they need to evangelize the, evangelize the world. They have to fulfill the gospel commission, right? They have a different method than the Catholic Church. And then, of course, you have uh, the dragon power, you know, this humanistic, worldly, secular philosophy that seeks to have this enlightened world one day where, you know, there's, there's no countries, there's no money, and there's no God, no religion, right? And everybody's going to live in happiness, you know, imagined by John Lennon. You know, there's this idea or these ideas that are all in conflict with each other. And we can't just focus on the fact of, you know, what the papacy is. <clears throat> we know there's an image to the beast. The image to the beast is made by the United States. But we also know that this dragon power still exists. And it's really Satan himself who's behind all of these things. So we can say papal Rome during the 1260s is typifying what's going to happen at the end of the world. But it's not going to be just the United States, and it's not going to be just the papacy, and it's not going to be just the World Economic Forum. Ellen White's quite clear. The United States is the one that's foremost in reaching its hand across the Gulf and across the abyss to join the hands, hands with these powers. And we don't understand exactly how everything's going to unfold, but we can take what the scriptures give us and recognize that all of these are dangerous. And people, humanity, Adventists, people in this movement, you know, we can sometimes sympathize with some of these powers because, because we're opposed to one of them or two of them, but we have sympathy with the other. Does that make sense? So, I mean, there are people who are just, just so opposed to wokeism uh, that they, that they will join hands with the United States, with the false prophet. They will see, you know, Trump being elected as a good thing. You know, this is World Economic Forum is going to enslave us and communism is all bad and, and, and Trump, Trump's good. So, you know, he's opposed to those things. But people will align themselves with just one part of Babylon. We saw it with uh, Parminder's movement. They align themselves with the dragon power. And, and some, some Adventists align themselves with, with Catholics because they're opposed to things like abortion and, and, and they become friends with Catholics and they don't see the Catholics as, as very dangerous. So I think this is, this, this illustration here, I think it's important to see these three powers here in these verses and that, that Satan is using these powers, but he doesn't really regard them. He, it's, it's really all about Satan. Satan is behind them all. Any thoughts on that? So, so the guy wrote the comments in, on my YouTube page. I don't know if he's going to accept any of that, but to me, it, it makes sense whether, and whether anybody else is going to accept it. I don't know. And then, then we address the point that in his, that is Christ's estate, 
that he, the papacy, will honor the God of strength, the God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, we, we took that sentence from the, tr- the translator's alternate reading. And so it's not saying that he will honor the God of strength, um, but he shall honor in the place of the God of strength, this God that his fathers knew not, that is this counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist. So really, which is himself. Um, but historically, right, this is the papacy is honoring this counterfeit Christ with all of this idolatrous worship. And, and that seems to make sense. That taking the sentence that way uh, allows us to preserve the idea that the God of strength is is the almighty God, as Young's literal translation uses. But as to the almighty God, shall he honor in his place? And we're saying that this place here ultimately really is the human heart. That's where Christ is to dwell. That's the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, represented as uh, the table of showbread in the sanctuary. And yet he shall honor counterfeit Christ, whom his fathers knew not, with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. So that makes sense to me. So verse 38, taking the this alternate reading from the translators, makes a lot of sense. It's very different from other readings, and from and our interpretation is quite different because of that, partly, from what we would see normally people understand about that verse. And, and we can see then that that you know this idolatrous worship in in the time of the papacy is in our history really dealing with the counterfeit Sabbath that is the Sunday. So when we get to the next verse thirty nine, thus shall he you know, historically the papal power do is advance against the most strongholds, and that is not in the most strongholds, but against the most strongholds where persecuted Christians have fled for refuge. And that is the truth of God's word. With a strange God, so this is the synchronistic, syncretistic Christian God, uh, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he, the papal power, shall cause them, that is the false gods, the saints, or the priesthood, uh, to rule. And we, and so we're going to have there that rule. We're going to connect to uh, the sun and the moon and the stars, right? And so this relates to time, uh, papal power in setting up false feasts and Sabbaths, times and laws over many, over Christendom, and shall divide. Uh, and we're using that word divide relating to uh, the making of a covenant, the land for gain. And we have the 4242 for gain. And so that's marking those that um, the 1260 and the 2520 ecclesiastical conquest through assumed papal authority, right? So then we can look at the present truth applications and we can see how these fall into place. The papal power represents the USA, Protestant America, making an image to the beast. And the place of refuge is the Sabbath, the seal of God, in opposition to the Sunday, the mark of the beast. And um, and and it's this that uh, they're going to acknowledge and increase with glory, that is, that's the United States is going to set up an image to the beast. And then when it says he, with the papal power in this case, now is representing Satan as well in our time, shall cause them, false gods, Satan's priesthood is going to parallel the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to rule. And of course, this would that definitely be uh, the enacting of the Sunday law. Right. So we can see how that fits it. And they shall divide or make this covenant and that would be receive the mark of the beast. And then we're going to see uh, Satan claiming and assuming power as the God of this world as the Antichrist. Now, there is a comment in the chat. Since 430 can mean the supreme God or pagan gods, people can be confused. However, it's the apostasy within Protestantism that allows the resurgence of the papal church, just as it was weakness within paganism that allowed the Bishop of Rome to become preeminent. Okay, I don't I don't see how the the one follows from the other. I'm not quite sure I follow the thought. Supreme God or pagan gods, and, and also the resurgence of the papal church. I mean, when it makes an image to the beast, it, it doesn't necessarily mean people are going to know they're directly worshiping the Catholic Church, right, or the Pope. 
you know, at least initially. So, and, and I, I'm not even quite sure that I really understand Satan's personation of Christ and how that relates to uh, the papacy. But um, I don't know. I don't know if you can explain it more, what you're thinking. No, I'm just saying because the, <clears throat> the, the pagans weren't strong enough not to resist Rome, uh, the Roman pontiff to be. And what I've been trying to explain to people lately is, oh, somebody had remarked, uh, the Jews kept Saturday as their Sabbath, you know, and the, and the Christians keep Sunday and all this stuff. And I said, well, in all the, in the writings of all, all the denominations, they announce that there's no biblical basis for keeping Sunday. Jesus kept the seventh day Sabbath, I explained. Friday sunset to Saturday sunset and so forth. And I gave a whole pile of scriptures. I didn't get a comment back though, but this is the second time I've had to deal with this with the same group of people. And the, if the Catholic Church boldly, and I remember this from my childhood, boldly asserts its authority in changing the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, they announce that Saturday is the Sabbath, but then they'll say it's the mark of our authority. It's the power that's been given to us i uh, i don't know it was in the catechism to change the sabbath to sunday and i remember that i never commented on it then i should have i should have asked my parents like what is this why well yeah they just believe the church has authority the pope has authority to set up feasts and remove feasts and so forth yeah and then Um, i would because i was always questioning things normally i would say well who gave them that authority like, well, why would God contradict his word? Yeah, because we know, you know, that the dragon will give him his power, his seat and great authority. But that great authority was not the dragon's authority to give. Right. Of course. His, his power and his seat, the dragon could give those. But the great authority, he, he gave something that was not his. And that's that's the religious authority. But, you know, the question, I mean, we understand, you know, the Catholic Church, bad. And we know that Satan, when he personates Christ, he's going to say that he he changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That he had power to do that. And the one thing I've never, I've never been certain of, it's not stated clearly in the spirit of prophecy, that when Satan personates Christ, he's a pope or something, or that he takes over the role of the pope. I mean, obviously, if he says he's Christ, I think the papacy would have to acknowledge that, you know, they're not the supreme authority in that in that sense. So I've never quite understood how this fits in with what the papacy itself perceives. I mean, they want everybody to be Catholics and, and you know, they want to evangelize the world in their way. And the pope is like the representative of Christ on earth. But I don't know if they're really particularly looking to hand that over to Christ. I mean, is that the idea that they have? I've never really understood how Catholics think it's going to end. That is, the Catholic Church, you'll see Catholics who have all different kinds of ideas. But really, what is it that the Catholic Church is seeking? Are they really thinking that at some point Christ comes back and then he just becomes the Pope, so to speak? You know, You know what I'm saying? So I've never quite understood that how they see it and and really exactly how the next it is. time I have a con or Theodore, the next time I have a conversation with a Catholic, I'm going to ask them that. Cause that, that is very, uh, that's very probing, you know, like uh, we know, uh, we know that the Jesuits and including Francis pray to Lucifer, the, the honest Jesuits will admit they worship Lucifer. Well, then if I ever encounter one, <laughs> I should ask, uh, do you regard Lucifer as God? Well, of course I regard Lucifer as God. How do you know that? Because I, I've, I've listened to Satanists, like those who proclaim themselves Satanists, and and they really believe that Lucifer is God. Like Lucifer is what is the person is comparable to what, what we imagine Christ to, or what we know Christ to be. Right? It's their well, their concept. Okay. Understand? So, but I think that's in some ways a moot point, though. And, and let me explain. So whatever conception they have of whoever the God of this world is and whatever they call him, et cetera, whatever their conception of God is, it's definitely not the God that I know of. 
I mean, the Catholic Church and even with the Protestants. I mean, this idea of a God that's going to torture people forever and hellfire, right? And even just the whole concept of the Catholic Church of of how they, you know, God is, is this very distant being, right? You have to have Mary has to intercede with, you know, between you and God. So whether individuals themselves, however they describe what they believe, whether they believe they're uh, worshiping Satan, the God of this world, they believe he's the God of this world, or whether they, they think they're worshiping the true God, really in some ways doesn't matter. I mean, it's definitely much more sensational to say that they, you know, they, they worship, you know, and pray to, to Lucifer directly. But the thing is, they don't need to do that to be praying to Lucifer, because we know that the Protestants, when Christ moved from the holy to the most holy, Satan went to the holy place and the Christians there were praying to Satan without knowing it. And, and I think for many Christians, if we look at their conception of God, it's definitely not the God of the scriptures. Right. They, they, they have these false views of God. And he that says, I know God and keeps not his commandments is a liar. Right. So many people claim to know God, but they don't really know God. So, I mean, it may be true. Right. I'm not saying that you're, you're not correct, but I'm saying it's not needed. It's not essential that that, that occurs in that way. Anyway, it's, um, yeah, I, main, I was maintaining yeah. with this group of people that are Sunday keepers that if you want to please God, keep all his commandments, including the fourth one, just as Jesus did. Yeah. And they, they could, they didn't have anything to say about that. I mean, what can you say then? You know, like, what can you say to that? If I really want to please God, I will keep all of his commandments, including the four. It, it, I think it got them thinking. So yeah. hopefully I'll have a discussion again. So, so when I became a Sabbath keeper, it wasn't in the Adventist church. I started keeping Sabbath uh, just on my own. I, I'd listened to Herbert W. Armstrong and some of his arguments about the Sabbath. But I, I used to have the view that you, you just have to be a righteous person. You know, a holy, a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy and you keep it holy every day. You have to be sanctified every day. And that, that the Sabbath just sim- signified or symbolized that sanctification. And there's actually a real truth to that. I mean, you obviously can't just be sinning six days a week and then become holy one day. You know, that you, the whole person has to be transformed. Uh, but it was the verse that, you know, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I started thinking about that and realizing, well, you know, the Sabbath is, you know, God's asking us to rest. That's nothing bad about it. Like, why can't I just try keeping Saturday as the Sabbath and see how that goes? And and what I found when I tried to keep the Sabbath is that it went contrary to my nature. I thought, well, you know, I'm a little bit lazy. It'd be nice to take one day off and just laze about. But, you know, it's often an opportunity to to make money. You know, and then you, you want to watch, you know, sports or whatever, or you want to go shopping. You feel like going shopping. You, you don't do that. Right. So I realized, hey, you know, this this really does show to me my need of God in a way that Sunday keeping really didn't because, you know, everybody's keeping Sunday sort of thing. That's easy to sort of do. And it, it's a bit more lax. You know, so I just decided to keep God's law, all of it. And of course, and in doing that, I started to see myself more as a sinner than I had before. So my dependence and need of God. So I saw the, the, the sanctification part of the Sabbath. But obviously, you know, there's more to it historically and stuff that I haven't learned about. And I had to learn about that as time went on, how the change occurred. But but I always knew that Sunday was not the Sabbath. Right. I always knew Saturday was the Sabbath because that, you know, when it talks about the Sabbath in the Bible, that's Saturday. It's not Sunday. But many Christians, you know, in like. In Ellen White's day, a lot of Christians didn't even know that. They just thought Sunday was always the Sabbath. You know, it's like it just never crossed their minds to think about it. And there's a lot of Christians like that. Um, they just kind of think the Sabbath, oh, that's Sunday, you know. And they don't kind of put it all together. But anyway, um, the main point that we're looking at here is this is consistent. What we have here with this historical application describing the papal power it's going to describe the power at the end of the world that we are facing, which is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, not just the papacy. And it's going to be Satan working through these three powers. And, and we see that with, you know, Revelation 13 and 14. We see how these all come together. You know, obviously, the United States making an image to the beast. 
that doesn't happen during the 1260 years. It happens in our time. And, and we can see that there's, there, there are differences as we compare these histories, right? Obviously, the papacy has this Sunday, and there are Sunday laws, but they are typical of the Sunday law, right? Which is, is done by the United States first. Any, any other thoughts about these verses? Cause I mean, we finished all the verses up to 39. We have this diagram here, which still relates. I don't know if that we, if we could draw a diagram sort of connecting, uh, I guess the one diagram that we, we would do is just dealing with that, um, verse 36. You know, I probably should do a diagram for that. I don't know if we need to draw it now, but dealing with the, the lexical sum, right? The 82,499 days that we can count from February 15th, 1798 to January 1st, 2024, dealing with the end of the divorcement. Now that's something that really deals with the present truth application. We can often see that the, the Hebrew numbers connect to our history, right? So we can also connect that to April 10th which is is also the first day of the first month in 2024. So we're not looking for like a specific date in 2024 that something happens. We're just saying that within this movement, what has occurred, 2024 represents the end of that divorcement. Now it could be, we also have April 5th, 2030 that marks that as well. So I, I don't know exactly how to address that, but but I could draw a diagram for that and put it into the, into the paper. So when we deal with verse 40, you know, at the time of the end, right, we've, we've already addressed that they've, they've talked about the time of the end. When we go back, way right back here. Yeah. So we're going to have, right. So in, in, when we get to 34 and 35, you know, we're going to be addressing 1798 to 1844. We're also going to be addressing 1989. So let me see here. Well, there's so much written here. I can't really skim through it. So, so all this stuff of t- at, at the beginning in 508 and 538 is going to s- symbolize stuff happening within the United States and within our lines. Some of this becomes really close, hits close to home, right? So, I mean, the main thing I guess here is when we're dealing with the historical application here. So try to ignore the present truth application. So it talks about the 1260. It talks about the time of the end in 1798. He gives us, they shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. The three angels' messages from 1798 to 1844. And even at the time of the end, 1798, because it is yet for a time appointed, right? And then we have the king of the, the north shall do according to his will. So this, this marker is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome all have this characteristic. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, describing the papacy and the amount of sin. So, and he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, right? And that's where we got that to determine that 45 years. So it's going to be dealing with the, the indignation and the time appointed, 1844. So where's this other one? There's another part and can't see it. So you understand what I'm talking about here, that we have at the time of the end, 1798, and the time appointed is October 22, 1844. Here, I'm going to search where's that verse where we have that. I know there's lots of results here. Oh, there is. In verse 29, it's going to talk about the time appointed, and that's going to be November 9th. So that was back a bit further. Okay, that's why. So when we went back to verse 28, then the king of the north shall return into his land with great riches. and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, Christianity, Judea, Palestine, and he shall do and return to his own land. And so we looked at this and we had these three possibilities. That was the, that was the one I was thinking of. So we had different ways we could look at and interpret this verse. And, and one was to take the time appointed, well, as 1989. And so we had these and we decided that all of these were acceptable because we're dealing with the latter and the former. So we know that because we're starting to look at verse 40 and there's some things we need to address in verse 40 regarding this. So we're saying that in verse 29, that this is actually describing verse 40, right? That's, that's what we said. So at the time appointed, and we're saying that that time appointed is November 9th, 1989 in the historical application. That the papacy and the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come towards the king of the south. 
Now, we made an application, a present truth application, but we, we can kind of just ignore that right now, just look at the historical. But it shall not be as the former. So the idea, either the former was uh, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, that is spiritual north and south and not literal, or as the latter, talking about the fall of Western Rome. So we can have that. And then the other one, the second one at the time appointed, November 9th, 1989, again, he, the papacy, the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south, the USSR, but it shall not be as the former that is in the spiritual, that is in the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, it's spiritual north and south, or as the latter, 1798. So we could say that the latter is not the fall of, of pagan Rome, but the fall of papal Rome. So that was just an, another option. It doesn't really, and that in that it is the north against the south and not south against the north. So the question was, why is it not like the latter? Now, the one that I sort of liked a lot is this last one. So I hope people remember this, what we were looking at before, because it was quite a while ago now. And at the time of point is we got the same thing, but it shall not be as the former, but the latter shall not be as the former. So that's the other reading. So the latter would be 1989 and the former would be 1798 in that the north and south are reversed. So it's talking about the time appointed being 1989, not October 22nd, 1844, right? Because this is talking about the repeat of history as well, right? So it's already talking about that history. And then we had, but the last shall not be as the first. So that's another reading. So the last shall not be as the first in that the north and south are reversed again. And we have present truth application. And then we had this one where we tried it out. We just crossed that out. It doesn't work. It's putting 1798 there instead of 1989. So when we get to verse 40, it's already told us about this. Right? So this is an important point. So we get to verse 40. At the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So, I mean, this is really one of the foundational uh, verses to this movement, Daniel 11, verse 40. So we all know, we all should know that um, the Uriah Smith's view, which is Alexander Keith's view, was that there are three powers here. And the atheistic power described from verse 36 to 39 is France not the papacy, and when the king of the south pushes at him, it's pushing at France, and when the king of the north comes against him, it's coming against France. And so we have two different powers. The king of the south comes against France, that's Egypt. The king of the north, Syria, comes against France, that's Turkey, comes against France. Right. So that is, and, and, and we can say that's the pioneer view. I mean, that's the predominant view in Millerite writings. So when we look into that, when we examined the uh, foundation, we looked at how they understood uh, these verses and they didn't have light on these verses. That is, they were mixing literal and spiritual together. They didn't take into account that it can't be the literal king of the north or the literal king of the south, that it has to be spiritual. And that's because it's after the cross, that is, it's after 538. The covenant is in, in the midst of that week, the 2520 for northern Israel. So it's after that. You, you can't be talking about, you know, literal Babylon, literal Rome. It's spiritual Rome. It's spiritual Babylon. It's spiritual king of the north. It's spiritual king of the south. And this, this flows. Now, when we look at verse 40 and how we, we've gone through these other verses, this naturally flows here, right? That is, we, we can almost say in some ways that when we get to verse 31 to 39, that it's, and even maybe verse 30, that in some ways those are parenthetical. That is, it comes back to what was talked about in verse you know, 28 and 29, and it gives us the time of the end because it keeps talking about the time of the end. And now it's going to address this in a very direct way with, with what's happening in 1798 and 1989 and how they're connected. So this is something unique in this study and how we understand this. And so we have to emphasize it and we have to recognize how how significant it is that we have noticed this. 
Now, the question, you know, would be for somebody looking on is, well, you know, they would just think it's it's nonsense. You, know, you don't know what you're doing. But I, I just think that this is extremely profound that we that when we get to verse 40 and we understand everything that has come before, it now makes much more sense. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. That is, we can see that the time of the end here is 1798, right? That, I mean, that's that's the time of the end. And we can see what happens in 1798. But it, it, it ties us to 1989. That is, it gives us the time of the end, but it's showing us that, that there's going to be Raphi and Paneum. That is, Raphi and Paneum are typifying these. So when, when we looked at Raphi and Paneum, and we looked at an application of them in a repeat of history, Raphi and Paneum are 1798 and 1989. Now, we make another further application as we create a present truth application. So when we address Raphi and Paneum as 1798, 1989, that's in a historical application. Does that make sense to people? Like we know Raphi obviously is the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Paneum, but they are typifying these events that are going to be talked about. And it basically is telling us that when I write this paper out, it, you know, I'll have all the connecting ideas and threads running through it. But if, you know, we go back through all of this history, this history that we did of Rome, everything is is presented in a logical way now. So, you know, I've always said for, for me personally, there didn't seem to be a lot of continuity or flow in studying Daniel chapter 11. It, it, it just always seemed to be very disjointed and that the history they were picking out didn't it didn't always make sense why it was being picked out. Now, of course, the more that we have studied. You know, even even prior to this study, I mean, understanding Raphi and Paneum and how they did, you know, this battle between the kings of the north and the kings of the south, why they are important. I mean, we have a much clearer understanding of why why this why we have the king of the north and the king of the south in 1798 and in, in 1989, because it's the spiritual king of the north and the king of the south in, in both cases. So so when we, we go through this history, so let's just go back. So we know we got. Rome comes to establish the vision. So this is just a really quick overview. So Rome comes to establish the vision. And the reason it does so, and I don't know why I have verse 14 to 35. It doesn't really make sense. So Rome comes and establishes the vision. And it comes at the time when we're, we're going to see the fall of Egypt. So Egypt is going to fall. The king of the south is going to fall to the king of the north. But it doesn't happen quite as simply as that, first you're going to have the Battle of Raphia, where the king of the south defeats the king of the north. And then you're going to have the king of the north defeat the king of the south. Right. So you're going to have the Battle of Paneum. So I'm just going to go through I'm just going to go through the historical application here. You know, in those times during the fifth Syrian war, there shall be many. There shall many Philip, the fifth king of Macedon and Antiochus, the third and other people along with him stand up. That is, they're going to make war against the king of the south and the king of the south there is Ptolemy the fourth Philopater and also the robbers of thy people or the breakers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision right so they're going to support Egypt historically and um, now we can see that there's a bunch of symbolism there that relates to the two desolating powers the Chazon is represented in here and that is we can see that that Rome exalting itself, we have all of these Babylon, Medea, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and all of these things have have come along, but they don't establish the vision. It's Rome that does, because Rome is going to bring about the crucifixion of Christ. And of course, it's going to be the final kingdom. So we can see that that vision there, 2377, the Chazon, the numbers itself represents and we looked at the symbols of the numbers, and that was uh, that combines the 2300 days and the seven times with the two sevens and even the 70 weeks, right? So it's it's showing that the Kazon, the 2520, has within it the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. So you can see 2300 days, and you can see 70, and you can see seven in that number H2377. It's also a period of six years and 186 days. The number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month is the 86 days. Add the numbers from the phrase, thou shalt exalt thyself to establish the vision. You add them all together. 
And we could count that from June 7th, 1982 to January 6th, 2020, one year in advance, in advance of the siege. So there was all of this that we connected to establish the vision. So we know that this uh, historically just relates to the fact that Rome is going to be this power, but they shall fall. And so it's going to talk about their fall and these two desolating powers. And that's why Rome is exalt themselves, right? Because these aren't just a, you know, a person. This is a system and it has two aspects. Now, now Rome is the final part of it, but it's still, we got pagan Rome and papal Rome, but it's still part of that. So Rome exalts itself. It's the last of those powers that has to exalt itself to establish the vision. And so it talks about the fall of pagan Rome. So they shall fall. That's 476 AD, pagan Rome, really, which is Western Rome, and 1798, papal Rome. So obviously we could include other things in there, but that's, that's sufficient. So the king of the north, and historically that's Antiochus III, shall come, and we're going to say that's uh, circa 200 BC, so this is the Battle of Panean, and cast up a mount, that's a siege, and take the most fenced cities of Judea, uh, that is Sidon, is one of them, and the arms of the south, uh, the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, shall not withstand and lose the Battle of Panean, shall not stand up, that is, he will not exalt himself. You know, they, they don't fulfill that role. It's going to be Rome that does that. And it doesn't really say neither is chosen people, it's just shall not withstand, King of Souls, shall not withstand the choicest people, uh, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. And then we have um, verse 16, but he pagan Rome that cometh against him, so this is Seleucid Syria, shall do according to his own will. So we see the papacy doing, or the paganism, pagan Rome doing according to his own will, just as the papacy does later in verse 36. And none shall stand before him. He will subjugate Syria and become the next king of the north. And he, pagan Rome, under Pompey the Great, shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So that's glorious lands, Judea, Palestine. And we can see how that's going to be typifying things at the end of the world, but we're not looking at that right now. And he shall be consumed. That's the, the 633 BC siege. And then pagan Rome under Julius Caesar also shall set his face to enter Egypt with the strength of his whole kingdom, all Caesar's military resources and the and upright ones, the Jews join with him. Um, that is the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. And thus shall he do, God has appointed by his providence and he, God shall give him the daughter of women, Cleopatra, corrupting her, causing her ruin, but she shall not stand neither before him after this he, sh he that is Caesar, shall turn his face unto the isles, that is the Mediterranean basin, and um, shall take many, uh, but the prince, Michael, shall cause the reproach to cease, introduce it. So here it introduces the cross. Without his own reproach, Christ has no shame of his own, and he shall cause it to turn upon himself. With the reference to the cross, Christ takes our shame upon himself. So when we're dealing here uh, with Caesar's turning his face unto his isles, this takes this contrast. There's a contrast between Caesar and Christ, right? So Julius Caesar shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. He's going to be assassinated. Then shall stand up in his estate, a razor of taxes, Augustus, in the glory of his kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, but by a peaceful death, death in AD 14. And in his, that Augustus's state, shall stand up a vile person, Tiberius, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. And he shall come in peaceably, as a peaceful transference of power after Augustus's death, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with arms of a flood, they, the Jewish nation, shall be overflown. And this is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. So we can continue to see how this naturally flows why this is happening, why they're talking about what happens with Rome and, and that they're needful in establishing the vision. This is all about what's going to happen uh, with the crucifixion of Christ. And then it's going to uh, go back to this history of the league and show really how it's the league that leads to the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Because it's going to address that part. 
as I addressed it earlier. So it's going to keep repeating and enlarging of this history. So then when we deal with this uh, Battle of Actium, Anthony, Cleopatra, and Augustus, Octavian, in this case, that, that this history here is addressed because it's it's typifying something and it's connecting these histories. So I guess I'll just read through this. Here, pagan Rome under Octavian, the king of the north, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. Right. So it's going to have the fall of Egypt with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he, that is Anthony, shall, shall not stand. Octavian defeated him in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. For they, Octavian and Marcus Vespanius Agrippa, a Vipsanius Agrippa, show forecast devices against him, Antony. Yea, they, Rome, the defeat of the portion of Egypt's meat, Rome was dependent upon Egypt for grain, shall destroy him, Antony commits suicide, August 1st, 30 BC in Egypt, and his Octavian's army shall overflow, and many countries are conquered by Rome. They shall fall down and be divided up, partitioned and slain. And uh, Egypt is conquered by Rome. So both of these kings, Octavian and Antony, so it goes back to their personal league. It shall be in both of these kings' hearts to do mischief. They both desire to control the Roman world and they shall speak lies at one table, form false alliances, but it shall not prosper. These agreements would last as per Actium at the end of the 2030 agenda is just the present truth thing. And for certainly yet at, um, and this is an iteration, right? So, so this word yet means an iteration. The end shall be at the time appointed, right? At the end of the prophetic periods under, uh, in October 22nd, 1844. So we got the end, the extremity, that's February 15th, 1798, shall be at the time appointed, the end of the prophetic periods. And then shall he, the king of the north, return into the, his land, Rome, with great riches, and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, Christianity, Judea, Pas uh, Palestine. So obviously it's not Octavian. This is going to be talking about Tiberius. So he shall do and return to his own land. And so then we went through and showed how uh, this time appointed and, and these the former and the latter, how they're all tied together. So everything naturally flows. So when we go through these verses and it starts talking about basically the fall of Rome, so it's going to go back and talk about the fall of pagan Rome, Eastern Rome or Western Rome. And then it's going to talk about the setting up, so the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate, Daniel 31 and 32. Uh, it's going to reference, we're going to see parallels with, with uh, Revelation 12. And so all these verses that we went over. So we can see how this all flows, right? Hopefully. I mean, that's really, once I put it into writing and I connect things more gradually, you'll see the flow better. But we can see how this all naturally flows. It's not just arbitrarily choosing events. All of these events and everything that happens is to emphasize what was being revealed to Daniel, which is the understanding of the Chizot. Because he already had understanding of the 2300 days and he already had understanding of the 70 weeks. But now he's given a fuller understanding of the end of the prophetic periods in 1798 and 1844, connecting these, these together. And also the history that we are in, 1989. So we can then see at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him? Well, we know that that the king of the south would be pushing at the king of the north, the one that we just had been describing, and that's going to be France in 1798. And then the king of the north shall come against him. That's going to be 1989. That's the Soviet Union that is now the king of the south, that the United States and the papacy together are the king of the north, like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So, I mean, this is well understood. We can see the historical application. He, papal Rome, shall enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. Many individuals will submit to Sunday legislation, but these shall escape out of his hand, uh, refuse to submit to Sunday legislation. Now, there is some things here that we're still going to have to address in the historical application. We, we've gone through it, 
but we need to start looking at how do we relate this to a present truth application, right? Right. That would, that, that would be the next step. So in the present truth application, because this is really talking about our history in the historical application, we would have to see that this relates to what has happened in the movement. That is, we know that 1989 is going to be typified or typifying November 9th, 2019, right? So this is going to bring us into our history. This is going to cover the history of the 777 days, at least, right? We're going to have uh, the pandemic in this history. That's going to be the Sunday law, right? So it, it should be pretty straightforward. Now, there are things that, um, and, and when doing that, we know that we're going to be addressing uh, the Hebrew numbers in these verses. Now, I need to open up a file here. So, now, when I was looking at this previously, let me see if I can find it, because I, I looked at um, the lexical numbers for Daniel 11, verse 40, and, and I think we touched on it before. Now, the lexical number for Daniel 11, verse 40, was 96226. That's the lexical sum. And so I have to find this. Trying to remember what I did with this. And I can't remember what I did now with this number. So there was some something significant about that number, but I don't remember what it was where I started it. 96226? Yeah. The 9 and the 6, you could reverse it to the 6 and the 9. Could it relate to Jeff's prayer? You know, was that 2018, I think? No, no, that's not what I did. It's just the span of time. Now, you know, if okay. I do, it's 263 years and almost a half. But what did I do with that? I'm trying to remember. So there was some significance. I mean, the one thing that, uh, you know, I addressed before was the fact that we have the king of the north and the king of the south here in, these ver in this verse. And um, so I think, yes. So one of the things I did. So I know there's something to do with the lexical sum. But also, if we take the king of the north, the king of the south, we take the, the Hebrew numbers. So king is 4428, and south is 5045, and north is 6828. And we add king of the north and the king of the south together. We get the number of days from when I was born to uh, November 9th, 2019. So that was one thing that connect us, connected us to 2019. But I believe there was something about the lexical sum itself. And I can't remember what it is. So the lexical sum for the entire verse. I don't know. Iran, you don't remember what we did with that? Not sure. So, so 96226. Yeah, I don't remember now. I, I should have remembered. But I kept thinking I'm going to remember that. But I don't. I mean, obviously, we have the time at the end. And we've already dealt with that. That that's a symbol of 360. And the end, right, 7093, we dealt with that number as well. That's Kate's. So the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So there's something else. Maybe I didn't take the whole verse. Maybe there's something else I did. Hmm. I can't remember. But anyway, there's some something. Maybe it wasn't that verse. Maybe it was the other verse. So anyway, we can connect this. In the present truth application, so let's just so we we dealt with this before. I know we talked about it before, but we just didn't uh, put a note here. So if we have this phrase, the King of the North and the King of the South, we can connect it to to my birthday. Now my birthday is significant; it's part of these lines. And of course, November 9th, two thousand nineteen, I'm going to count the three hundred ninety one and a half days from October thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. And so the fact if we take the phrase king of the north, king of the south, we take the lexical sum, and it's the number of days between my birthday and November 9th, 2019. Here, I'm, I'm just going to check it. Is it really that? Um, I'm just make sure I'm doing it right. So we got 4428 times 2 plus 5045 plus 6828. Right, so that's so yeah, 20,729. So I go from the end of my birthday, February 6th. You know, so it goes to November 9th, 2019. Okay, so that's correct. I was just making sure it wasn't November 9th, 1989. But it's November 9th, 2019. So that connects. So that gives us this present truth application. Now, 
So you're saying that if we go back from November 9th, 2019, it brings us to May 25th, 1756? Uh, that's what I was remembering for that number, the 96226. Okay. Yeah, okay. So it brings us back to that date. Now, May 25th is just a symbol of 525. In 1756, I don't know of any significance there. Well, the calendar change happens, isn't it 1752? Yeah, I think that's what we were looking at before was the calendar change. So that's going to be um, 1752, and that's going to be... So what ended up happening there is that they're going to... um, One is they're going to move the start of the year from March 25th over to January Mm -hmm. And then 11 days are dropped from the month of September. So September 2nd is followed by September 14th. So if we go there, I know our time is almost up here. Um, so if we go to 1752, I know we, we did something with this before, didn't we? So that's the date. September 2nd goes, the next date is following that. If we count from there, it brings us to 2016. So February 18th would, would be if we counted from this um, September, you know, so that would be February 28th, 27th. Okay, so February 27th, or February 28th, actually, February 29th. So February 28th, I guess, is the date we take. 2016. So I don't know if that's significant. February 28th, 2016. Yeah. So anyway, we're, we're finished here for today. We're going to come back to this. I'm going to try to remember what it was that um i saw before okay any final thoughts before we close with prayer okay let's pray dear father in heaven thank you for the study this morning help us to continue uh to study on our own we pray for one another that you can help us through today help us to follow and serve you and to understand these things more clearly we pray this in jesus name amen